Strange Brew Podcast, Season 1, Episode 178. Not normally a big NHL guy. I think over the course of 178, or I guess 177 episodes of Strange Brew, we've probably talked a total of 140 seconds of hockey. But tonight's a big one. We had a bet on the Oilers when they were down 2-0, paying 4-1, and it's Game 7 tonight. And they were down 3-0. Now it's even. Everything's on the line tonight. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Talk about the Brewer road trip. Not a great weekend in San Diego, but salvage the fourth game of the series on Sunday. Tobias Myers just keeps rolling. When they need consistency in the rotation, he has brought it. We will discuss that. If he has a good start this weekend, I would think, like we talked about last week, he could be the NL Pitcher of the Month for the month of June. He's got one more start this weekend against Craig Council and the Cubs. Talk about the NBA. There are trade rumors revolving around Brook Lopez right now. The draft is this week. It's Wednesday, Thursday. The Bucks actually have picks, which is something that hasn't happened a lot recently. They've got the 23rd and 33rd picks in the draft. Maybe you combo that up and trade Brook with the pick and get somebody a little younger, more athletic on the front line. We'll see rumors of that over the weekend. And we have a little bit of Packer news we're going to hit on, some breaking news here in the last 20 minutes. Let's go. On the ground, a chance here. Durham to Hardy to first. In time! Yes! The Brewers yes! win! Here comes Melvin to the 25, to the 20, Gordon 15, 10, 5, touchdown, Wisconsin, record-breaking run. Morgan, a smash up the middle, base hit to center, here comes Gomez, around third, a throw, and the Brewers win. Here's the snap, he looks, he throws, it's a double and there is your Super Bowl dagger. Booker the drive, gets inside, leads in. Backed away and stolen by Holiday. Phoenix has to foul. On a tentacle ball, throws it down. Swinging fly ball in the right center. Broxton is there. And they're the champions. They have done it. It's been a 50-year journey. Wisconsin, we've got a room at the top of the world tonight. The Milwaukee Bucks are NBA champions. Breaking news about 20 minutes ago, a little before 9 o'clock. We're recording this at 9.22. We have a succession plan. Where's my succession? You're an HBO succession fan. We have a plan now for the person that is going to be next in line behind Mark Murphy as the next president of the Green Bay Packer Football Club. What a show this was. This was one of the best HBO shows. And it was only three seasons or four seasons. Okay, we can't afford to play that entire thing. But anyway, we have the next president lined up. Ed Policy is going to be the next president. El Presidente. He'll be the next president, and it will be in July of 2025 that he will take over. So the last of the Mark Murphy regime will be hosting the draft in April and then getting basically to the owner's meeting in July of next year, and then that's it for Mark Murphy because he has reached the age where he can no longer be president, 70 years old. I don't know when they wrote that into the Packer Constitution, but they cannot have a president. Once you turn 70, you are out, which I always find funny because you look at politics, you look at the political world, or how old is Joe Biden? 83, 84 years old, and he's running again, and Trump's almost 80, and you've got senators and congresswomen and congressmen that are in their 80s and 90s. It's just so funny to me that however many decades ago, they sat at a table writing up this Packer Constitution and said, well, we have to have a president. Somebody has to be in charge of the board. But once they get to 70, we can't allow a 70-year-old to run an NFL team. A sports franchise said, no, we can't, we can't have somebody 70-year-old or running this team, an NFL team. Are you kidding me? And meanwhile, in politics, the people who supposedly make the decisions that make or break the entire country, the most powerful country in the world, We allow them to go on for forever until their 80s and 90s and some of them their late 90s by the end of their run. 70 years old. Oh, absolutely not. We cannot have that kind of a person in charge of an NFL franchise. Murphy is knocking on the door of that 70th birthday and then he is going to be done. But Ed Policy, I know this was the guy that a lot of people thought was going to get this job. Is he related to who was the guy for the Niners for so long? Remember in the 90s, they always cut to the Niners booth 
anytime there was a big 49ers game and it was Carmen policy. Let's get the Ed policy. We'll get the back of the baseball card here. He is an American football executive, according to Ed Policy's Wikipedia page. He is the current COO and general counsel for the Green Bay Packers. He was previously the commissioner of the Amer- of the Arena Football League. Oh, yeah, he is. He's the kid of Carmen Policy. Is Carmen Policy, is that who I'm thinking of? Yep. So this is the kid of Carmen Policy. It was a big executive for the 90s in the 90s for the San Francisco 49ers. All right, so Ed Policy, he has been at least vice president since 2012. So he's been with the organization for 12 years. And he is going to take over when Mark Murphy hands him the baton July of 2025. But he will now be the, I guess, the president in waiting. That was breaking news here this morning. Ed Policy, the next president. Wasn't there right before Mark Murphy? I seem to remember that was fumbled a little bit. I'd have to go back and look. I think there was... There must have been something right before Murphy, or was there an interim? I'm going to Google this right now. God, it would be nice to have a producer, wouldn't it? Packer President History. I seem to remember they named someone, and then like two days after they named this person, they stepped down. Bob Harlan was until 2005, so Harlan was 89 to 2005. Yeah, John Jones. John Jones took over for Bob Harlan in 2006. And he was the team president for how long? He was named the CEO. Harlan's planned retirement in May of 2007. Oh, yeah. Jones experienced health complications and complaints about his leadership style. And then ultimately it went to Murphy. So he was like the president in waiting for maybe a week. And then they ultimately determined that Mark Murphy was going to be the guy who was going to be succeeding Bob Harlan. That was a weird time just overall for the Packers. Coming off of a bad year in 05, they had a switch up with the GM where Ted Thompson took over, then the Aaron Rodgers draft pick, and then Harlan stepping down. There was a there was tumult. I would say there was tumult at that time in 05, 06, 07. John Jones. But Ed Policy will be the next team president taking the mantle July 25th, it looks like, 2025. We may as well just stick with the Packers here for a second. Shout out to Jordan Love. He has been on Instagram. I've seen a lot of people sharing pictures of his vacation from his Instagram post. Him and his girlfriend, well, now fiance, Rhonda, or Ronika, I'm sorry, have been in Florence, I think, since last week or two weeks ago. And he popped the question, it looked like, yesterday. So Jordan Love and Ronika Stone, they are now engaged. All those pictures all over social media. What are you thinking about, I mean, Jordan? what are you thinking Marriage? about, Jerry? Marriage? Family? Well, they're yeah. prisons, <laughs> man-made prisons. You're doing time. Oh, no. You get up in the morning, she's there. You go to sleep at night, she's there. It's like you got to ask permission to, to, to use the bathroom. Is it all right if I use the bathroom? <laughs> there a dinner conversation there, too? Yeah, and you can forget about watching TV while you're eating. I can? Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know what? Because it's dinner time. And you know what you do at dinner? What? You talk about your day. <laughs> How was your day today? Did you have a good day today or a bad day today? Well, what kind of day was it? Well, I don't know. How about you? How was your day? That's Jordan Love. That's what he's in store for now for the rest of his life. I just, the vibes on this team. I know we talked about this a week or two ago coming out of either OTAs or coming out of minicamp. And the energy from the players in all of the interviews they did during that run of OTAs and minicamp and everybody's talking about taking the next step and the chemistry is beyond anything anybody's ever seen in a locker room before. Quay Walker, I want to say, had an interview with Larry McCarron where McCarron asked him about that and Quay said, look, I've been on national title teams in Georgia. This team has that and then some. I know we talked about just the vibes and momentum of the offseason and the young team taking another step forward. This just adds to it to me because now you've got the story of the franchise quarterback, the next franchise quarterback. He's given out rings in the preseason, and he's going to be bringing home rings in the postseason. You've got that whole story arc going on. You know the contract is coming then. I don't think he'd be doing this if the if he didn't have at least some idea that he was going to be making 50 or 55, or I saw now some reports of $60 million a year for Jordan Love. But this just adds to it. The guys love each other. They like hanging out. They're friends. It's a young team. They're on the ascent. You've got this new likable franchise quarterback. He's out in Florence. He's up hobnobbing with all the Italians and getting married. I mean, it just – and getting engaged. It just seems like everything is green arrow up for this Packer team. I've got like 1994 or 1995 vibes with this team right now where it kind of felt like in that era 
you are about to see them take that next step where they're going to be competing for championships and they've got like a two or three or four year window and we're right at the beginning of it and it's a fun young team. At that time, it was Favre and old bag of donuts, Frankie Winners and Chewy and Levins and all those guys got along and hung out and Don Beebe and the whole crew. I'm getting similar vibes of the mid-90s teams to the vibes we're getting right now from Green Bay. I cannot wait for this season to start and this just adds to it. Al, he's engaged. You know the contract is probably coming shortly, but congrats to Jordan Love and Ronica Stone. Getting engaged in Florence at a beautiful setting, and that was yesterday. That news broke on all sorts of social media. Well, That just adds to it. It adds more fuel to this momentum, I feel like, this Packer franchise has right now. Now watch him go 7-11 and this year. <laughs> it could be a totally different tone by the time we get to the end of this whole thing. And they went 6-11 and or whatever it is, or 7-10. and I don't think so. This does. This feels like 94, 95, maybe 95, 96, somewhere in there, where it just feels like we're on the verge of something big. All right. Let's discuss. Before we get into the Brewers, I do just want to hit on the NHL. I think we talked about this, right? We've got some money on this series, baby. And we're at a game seven now. Florida Panthers, Edmonton Oilers. Like I talked about, I think, on the last podcast, I've got a friend, one of my wife's closest friends growing up, her husband, and now we've all gotten to know each other over the years. They visit a couple times a year. We visit them. He's a big hockey guy. And I texted him when the Oilers were down 2-0 because I don't follow hockey, but I saw the series price was up to plus 410 for Edmonton to win. And I do know a little bit about Connor McDavid. I'm not well-versed in the hockey universe, but I knew some of the stars on that team. And I thought, God, down 2-0, they're coming back home. You see that happen where a team gets beat those first two games on the road, then they return, serve at home, and then you've got a best of three. And if you get to a best of three paying four to one or more than four to one, that's pretty good value. So I sent him a text and said, look, I know being down 2-0, it's not likely Edmonton wins, but did they play well enough? I guess that was the information I was seeking. Did they play well enough in games one and two where you feel like they're on even footing with this Florida team, or did they get crushed in games one and two, and this is just a matter of time they're going to lose in four or five? And he said, no, they they were there in both those games, and they can easily win a couple games at home, and the value's pretty good. He said plus 400 felt about right. So we put a little tickler on it. We put a little, a little. <laughs> we'll tell you how much if they win tonight. We put a little tickler on it at the Edmonton Oilers plus 410. Well, then they lose game three, and I'm pretty much writing that off. Even though the bet is still pending, if you are somebody that gambles on sports, you know if you make a future bet like that, the bet is still pending. You haven't lost that money yet, but you're already counting it as a loss in your brain because they're down 3-0. And only one team in NHL history has come down from 3-0 in the Stanley Cup Finals. It's happened multiple times in the Stanley Cup playoffs. But the only team to do it in the finals and make it all the way back and win the Cup in the championship series, the Toronto Maple Leafs in 1942. They go down 3-0. I'm thinking, all right, that's a sunk cost. We lost that. That's fine. It happens. I took a risk. I took a little risk on a on a hockey future. That's fine. But then they come back in game four, and Shania Twain performs before game four, and then they win 8-1, to one, which kind of like the series in the NBA. You thought, all right, they got one, just like the Mavericks got one in game four, and likely Florida will end this in the gentleman's sweep, the best of five, the gentleman's sweep, 4-1. to one. But then Edmonton wins game five. Okay, now you're back home for game six with a lot of momentum. And on Friday, they take it again, five to one. Remember on Friday's podcast, we said this is huge because now you get to a game seven, anything can happen in a game seven. And if it gets there, all of the pressure feels like it is going to be on Florida because they have blown a 3-0 series lead. Listen to the crowd. This is after the empty netter that put Edmonton up four to one on Friday. This crowd with the smoke going off once they hit the first of two empty netters is just high. Barkov did move it in closer. Again, they struggle up high. Here's an empty net for McLeod. Unbelievable pop. Four to one, Edmonton. That is incredible. Four to one, Edmonton. They scored another one, and I guess... They are crediting Edmonton fans think that Shania is their good luck charm because she performed before game four, and that seemed to spin the whole series. So there's this other video. I don't know how clearly this comes through in terms of audio, but the video is amazing. At the end of the game on Friday, it's 5-1 to one Edmonton. There's a minute left, and it's over. Edmonton's going to force a game seven. And you've got the Edmonton music guy, whoever's playing all the hype music, is playing Shania Twain's banger, Man, I Feel Like a Woman. 
and you can hear the crowd just going berserk and la- and singing along to this song. And meanwhile, the TV cameras are panning the Panther bench, and it's just sad face after sad face after sad face. And then in the background, you've got this raucous crowd singing along to Shania Twain. Of Florida Panthers. Ten days ago, this would have never seemed possible. I mean, they just look and dead. The weight of Game Seven, the weight of being on the wrong side of history, will rattle around. You've got to hear Schneider. Impossible for it not to. The chore for Paul Maurice and the Panthers is to erase as much of that as you can. Can you find confidence on a plane? Well, they better find it. Seeing some Shania Twain, and many believe uh, she helped turn this around as a good luck charm, but she performed prior to game four. All the momentum just feels like it's on Edmonton's side. Now, from what I do know about hockey and what I do understand about hockey is that it's the most random it feels like sports sometimes. Their playoffs feel like they are the most random playoffs, even though these two teams were two of the best teams all year. And even though Edmonton rolled and they have all the momentum, it would seem, they've tied the series now. It's a do-or-die game seven. Florida could come out there and score three first-period goals, and before you know it, literally all this momentum we thought Edmonton had would be gone just like that. I've seen it happen in the limited amount of hockey that I've watched in my life. But we're right there now with this plus 410 ticket. The only question is, do we hedge? Do you hedge? Now, let me explain hedging for my mom. I have a bet now where it's down to one game because I bet on the underdog at plus 410. So what you could do in this situation, now that they've gotten it to a do-or-die game seven, I could put a bet on the Panthers tonight to cover my bet. So whatever I put, and I'm not going to tell you how many entertainment points are on it, whatever I put on Edmonton on plus 410, I could then put that same amount on Florida because it's paying one-to-one. And that way, if Florida wins tonight, it's like nothing happened. I'll just get my money back, and I won't lose anything. And if Florida wins tonight, then I walk away and nothing happened. If Edmonton wins, if I put the hedge down, if Edmonton wins, I would win less than I would if I just let this bet ride. The safe play, most professional gamblers who actually do live this way and make money this way would tell you I'd be a fool Not to at least cover my bet by putting a Florida Panthers bet down tonight. And then that way, if Florida wins, I walk away as if nothing ever happened. And I'm bummed, but at least I'm not losing money. And if Edmonton wins, I win slightly less than I would have won had I done nothing. That is the prudent thing to do. I'm not that prudent of a person, though. That's the problem. I'm really not. I almost feel like putting more money on Edmonton. As you see, too, there is an Edmonton fan, a woman... In the conference finals, before the Stanley Cup finals, that went viral for after an Edmonton goal, she flashed the crowd. Enter my Jerry Lawler here. She flashed the crowd. And somebody was taking video of it, and it went viral on Twitter. Well, that person has now gained a certain amount of social media fame. And apparently she, on Sunday or over the weekend, she posed for Playboy. And on Sunday, I was looking for some reason to double down on this team. Why would I, What's a good reason to double down, double the, double down on this Edmonton team? And I saw that story trending on Twitter. I thought this is this is as clear a sign as any to put even more money on Edmonton to cash an even bigger ticket if they win tonight. Oh, uh, the prudent, the responsible thing to do would be to put a bet down on Florida so I at least cover myself and I don't lose anything no matter what happens tonight. But then I could win. I could win so much more if you leave it. Oh, it should be fun. I can't wait. I have something to look forward to on a Monday. You don't get that a lot in summer, especially. Something to look forward to on a Monday night. I am excited. 7 o'clock puck drop tonight. Let's get that ship, boys. Let's win a Great Lakes freighter. Let's win a cable ferry. Let's win a cabin cruiser. Let's win a Boston whaler. Let's win a recreational trawler. Let's win a paddle steamer. Let's win a pleasure barge. Let's win an outrigger. Let's win a freshwater vessel. Let's win a naval drifter. Let's win a water rambo. Let's win a landing craft. Let's win a saltwater lugger. Let's win a sea tugger. Let's win a luxury Let's go! Oh, no, that should be fun tonight. Normally, I'm not somebody super locked into the Stanley Cup playoffs or the Stanley Cup finals, even though 
Even the most casual hockey fans I know say it is the best playoffs of any of the major sports. It's just so many random things happen, and the crowds are going nuts every game. And it is highly entertaining. I just don't ever get fully into it. But now, (laughs) with this ticket, with this ticket on Edmonton, we are all Oilers fans tonight. Unless you're hate listening to this podcast, in which case you could pull for Florida, I guess. I appreciate your ears either way. Let's talk about the Brewer weekend. Frustrating. Frustrating series in San Diego. We talked on Friday coming off of the Thursday game where they battle all the way back and then Cronenworth walks it off with a solo shot in the ninth inning. So the Padres won Thursday 7-6. Then Friday was one of those losses. And in a 162-game schedule, these are going to be littered throughout the year. We've been fortunate this year and in recent history, really, when you think of this run we're in right now, this Brewer era of winning 85-plus games a year and being in the playoffs. There aren't a ton of these. I remember these being a big part of my childhood, watching for the Brewers, watching Brewers in the mid-90s and early 2000s. Those types of losses like we saw on Friday happen all the time. They happen multiple times a week. So we are very happy and fortunate we moved on to a different era of Brewer baseball where this isn't happening as much. But it was one of those games where they got down early, then they score four runs, I think, in the fifth inning. They had a 4-1 to lead, fifth or sixth inning, and the late inning relief has been so good most of the year for the Brewers. It just wasn't on Friday. And the Padres were coming up with some pretty good hits, too. Sometimes it's not even that your pitchers were bad in baseball. It's that hitters, and the Padre hitters were hot on Friday. They're making contact with pitches out of the zone. They're putting them in tough spots. There were tons, I mean tons, of two-strike hits off of Padre bats on Friday. And they just couldn't stop the bleeding. It just felt like every time there was a clutch situation, somebody for San Diego was coming up with a big hit. And eventually the Brewers lose that game 9-5. to five. So they had, a, I think they ultimately had a 5-1 to one lead at some point. And they lose that game 9-5. to five. How many hits did they give up on Friday? You thought when they got that 4-1 to one lead, they gave up 15 hits on Friday. Yeah, they had a 4-1 to one lead. Then the Padres tied it and then took a lead 5-4. to Then the Brewers tied it at 5. And then in the 7th inning, they give up three runs. Padres got a tack on in the 8th inning. Pound out 15 hits, and the Padres won Friday 9-5. to five. The most frustrating part about Friday, the Padres committed four defensive errors. There are not a whole lot of games. I'd have to get into the research department here, get to baseball reference, and check out... How many times a team has committed four errors in a game and then won by four runs? Not just one by a run or one in extra innings or whatever. They won 9-5 to five with four errors. Brewers only had one error in that game on Friday. Padres had four, and still they lost by four runs. And that was one we were up until about midnight. That was a long game because of all the errors and hits and runs. That was a frustrating game on Friday night. Then Saturday, I got to be honest, we weren't able to watch much of the game. There was severe weather in Wisconsin, in southeastern Wisconsin, depending on where you're listening. I think even our Madison area listeners, there were tornadoes going through there in the Janesville area. So by the time we were out at a grad party on Saturday, and by the time we got home, basically it was just severe weather coverage front to back. And it was a national Fox TV game on Saturday. So it's not like you could even load up the Bally app, and even if the Bally app was working or it wasn't working, you could not watch it that way. So there wasn't a whole lot to watch. I was kind of watching on the score center, but that was it. It was a 6-0 game. It didn't seem like we were going to miss anything. Then all of a sudden, Bryce Terang hits a grand slam with two outs in the ninth inning, and you get to 6-4, but that's as close as they get on Saturday in a 6-4 loss. And you're feeling like by Sunday, we could use a win. It's not a mess yet. But you could use a win here. You don't want to get swept in four games. The Brewers had not lost four games in a row going into Sunday. One of, I think, three teams left this year that has not had a four-game losing streak. And you would have just, going into Sunday's game, you just wanted to get that win. You get on the plane, then finally you get back home starting tonight, and you have good vibes. You have good energy on the plane ride, and you're not sitting in a four-game losing streak with what would have been, what then, a two-and-five road trip. It was... Not necessary, but nice (laughs) that they got that win on Sunday. It wasn't going to derail the entire year, I don't think. But you never know. In baseball, you never know. You lose on Sunday, and the Cardinals are hot. The dark magic, everybody. I warned you. Everybody that was running the Cardinals off, they're getting hot. They sweep the Giants at home over the weekend. So it's a five-game lead now. It was a a six-and-a-half game lead when we last recorded on Friday. It's a five-game lead now. And if you would have lost on Sunday... You would have been 2-5 and five on the road trip. You would have lost four in a row, and that lead would have been down to four games. It was pretty important to win that game on Sunday, and they did. They took care of business, put five runs up in the second inning, 
got a little lucky themselves. Kind of like what the Padres did to the Brewers Friday night. Some of those were blue pits. The Blake Perkins two RBI single was a blue pit, a Texas League hit with two outs where if it lands or if it's one foot to the left or right, maybe it's caught and the inning's over and it's just a one nothing game. They were able to come up with that in the second inning. Sal Freelick had an RBI. Terang had an RBI triple. Tyler Black, who's back up, had two hits. He had an RBI on Sunday. So you get the 5 nothing lead. And then the story to me and the story of this month in terms of the starting rotation, Tobias Myers. This guy has been incredible. He goes five innings, gives up only one run on Sunday, little shaky in the fifth inning. And I think because of how maybe big in the minds of the Brewers that game was on Sunday, and they wanted to make sure we don't lose this one, when things got a little uneven for Tobias Myers, they pulled him after that fifth inning, went to their bullpen. Brian Hudson just continues to be locked down. It is a travesty if this guy is not an all-star. He goes two scoreless again on Sunday. His ERA is now .86. I know he's not a closer, so you're not going to get the sexy save stats or the hold stats even. And it's tough for a middle reliever to get that all-star nod. But if you give an all-star nod to one middle reliever in the National League, it has got to be Brian Hudson. And when you've got that weapon, as Tobias was struggling a bit in that fifth inning, you think, listen, we're not messing around here. This is a game we want to get. We don't want to get swept in four games. Get our high leverage guys in there now and don't risk this. And that's exactly what they did. He gives you two scoreless. Piamps, again, a little uneven, gave up one run. But you also added an attack on run in the, in the eighth inning off the bat of Jake Bowers. And then McGill, even though it wasn't the save situation, this shows you how important that Pat Murphy viewed this game as. The fact that he used McGill in a non-save situation just to say, listen, we want to hammer this thing down. We're not messing around even a little bit. And he goes 1-2-3 in the ninth inning. They get the 6-2 to two win. But Tobias Myers... He now has 25 and a third innings pitched in the month of June. He has given up two runs, two. And he's piling up some strikeouts, only had three on Sunday. We said on Friday that if he has two good starts in his remaining June starts, we said this on the Friday podcast, that he should be on the short list of guys that could win NL Pitcher of the Month for the month of June. Well, he goes out and gives you five innings of one-run ball on Sunday. And now, like we said, 25 and a third in the month of June has only given up two runs. He's got one more start. It is going to be Saturday afternoon against the Craig Council-led Cubs. I think even if he's serviceable in this game on Saturday, he gives you five innings of two-run ball or even five innings or six innings of three-run ball, I still think that's going to be enough to get him pitcher of the month designation. Tobias Myers. Myers has now won four straight starts. It is the first pitcher, and if you are somebody that listens to the B93 Morning Show, we are going to be using this for trivia alert. We are going to be using this as our Brewer Friday trivia question. He is the first rookie pitcher since 2008 to win four straight starts, and the last pitcher that did it, Manny Parra. Manny Parra, who was not bad early in his career. Do you remember Manny Parra threw a no-hitter in the minor leagues? They brought that up every time Manny Parra got a start from the second he got called up to the major league level. For every subsequent year, they brought that up. Oh, he once threw a perfect game. I think it was a perfect game. It wasn't just a no-hitter. It was a perfect game. Oh, Manny Parra once threw a perfect game in major league baseball. He was not bad in 2008. Was that the year that him and Prince got into it in the dugout after one bad Parra start late in the year? Or was that maybe a year or two later? That might have been a year or two later. I remember Parra got out there and got rocked. And I think he gave up, I don't even know, five or six runs in the early innings. And then in between innings, Parra was going to get up and go to the locker room, which most pitchers do. And they're starting pitchers for the most part. If they get lifted in the middle of an inning, they'll watch the remainder of that inning to see if any of the guys that they left on base are going to score or if they're still going to be in line for a win at the end of that inning. And then most pitchers will leave the dugout, go to the locker room, go over some film, take a shower, start to get the treatment they get on their arm after every start. That is not unusual. So Manny Parra got up to leave. I got to find out when that was. Manny Parra got up to leave the dugout, and Prince Fielder frustrated with the night the offense was having and frustrated that Parra put them in a six or seven run hole. Remember, he shoved him back down on the bench. And then the reports were that Prince said to Manny, we watched your bleep. Now you're going to watch our bleep. (laughs) And that was the end of it. I can't imagine how terrified Manny Parra must have been when they got into it. Here it is. 
2008? Yeah, that was late that year. Apologetic fielder says disagreement with Para got out of control. He just shoved him back in his seat. You sit here and you watch this now. You put us in this hole, you watch this. But early in that year, he won four straight starts. He actually won six. So that's the record, I think, for a Brewer rookie pitcher starts one in a row. So Tobias has some work to do to get to that. But Parra won six in a row to begin that year. I never understood how that stuff that Manny Parra had did not translate to the major league level, to success at the major league level. Because that guy, he would throw 95 to 97 mile an hour fastballs. His curveball fell off of a table, had such sharp break, and he just could never rein it in. He wasn't consistent. He had bad innings. He'd give you five shutout, and then he'd give up four or five runs in the sixth inning. He's just one of those guys who couldn't sequence it together for a whole start. But when I think back to my time watching Brewer baseball and pitchers that had the electric stuff, the type of stuff that you dream about, a lefty starter who's throwing that hard fastball and has a slider and has a curveball that falls off a table, a 12-6 to curveball, how is this guy not winning 15 to 20 games a year? It never made sense to me that Parra did not turn out better than he was. But that is the guy that Tobias Myers matched with that start with that win against San Diego on Sunday. Right when they needed a solid start, the rookie Myers gives it to him. He comes out of Sunday with a 5-2 and two record and a 3.13 ERA. Now, Colin Ray had a tough start, his first in a while. That was Friday night. He had a difficult start on Friday. So is Tobias Myers right now the ace of this staff? He might be. Otherwise, over the weekend, we saw Bryce Terang have a great weekend. He should be an all-star. I think all-star voting... We get down to the finalists at each position on Thursday, right? The 27th. Today's the 24th. Yeah, so Thursday, we'll get down to the finalists at each position. And then I think the voting for the starters then goes through the 3rd of July or the 4th of July. But the Brewers should have, when I look up and down this roster right now, the Brewers should have, I would think, Terang as an all-star. I would think Brian Hudson as an all-star. They should have two or three, maybe four all-stars. Terang should be, though. Terang had nine hits in this four-game series against the Padres, including that Grand Slam on Saturday and the RBI triple on Sunday. So he's hitting for some power, too. And with the defense he plays, even though he had that bad bobble, which we talked about on Thursday night, that opened the door for a big early inning for San Diego, for the most part, he is locked down defensively and should have a fast track to a gold glove at second base. With that now combined with hitting, he's 296, hitting for some power, OPS just short of 800. I would think Terang is in line for an all-star berth. I would hope. But he was big over the weekend. And Jackson Churio, he came off the bench on Sunday, had two hits, had a single and a double down the line, scored a run. He is now in the month of June hitting 294 with an OPS of 823. He's getting comfortable. And that double down the line yesterday, I don't know if you saw that late in the game, his second at bat in the eighth inning, that led to that insurance run off the bat of Jake Bowers, who also has been kind of hot in the month of June. It was one of those where he took a couple of bad pitches, waited for his pitch, and then squared it up once he got one in the zone. And that bat speed is elite. I don't know that I've ever seen anybody with bat speed quite like Churio's. But we've been over the growth and development of this 20-year-old who has an eight-year, $90 million contract. It was rough going early, even though he burst onto the scene on that opening day game in New York where he had a hit and a walk and a stolen base and a couple runs. His first three or four games were really good. And then he got into the slumps that you expect a 20-year-old at the major league level to go through. Well, he's taken his hits in the first two months, but this month of June, he has been excellent and showed again on Sunday, hitting just short of 300 in the month of June. You salvage the win on Sunday. They go 3-4 and four on the road trip. That's not bad for as maddening as those three games were against the Padres. Seven-game road trip, you'd love to go 4-3. and three. 500 on the road, that's sort of the rule of thumb. They were right around that at 3-4 and four on the road trip. And now they come home, and they get the reigning World Series champions. The Rangers have not been great this year. They've had a lot of injuries. And they might have been a team that just got hot at the right time of year last year. They are 37 and 40, so three games under 500. They've got a pretty fair distance in the AL West right now. Six and a half back there. How are the wild cards looking? The Rangers, oh, they're four back in the wild card. What is the National League wild card? Braves, yeah, Cardinals, and they are getting there. And now the Padres would be the last team in as of right now. Padres are right at the halfway point after that loss on Sunday. They're 41-41. and 41. And the Nationals, a bad Nationals team, is just a game under 500. 
Well, the Rangers are in that wild card conversation. A lot of what they used to win the World Series is back from last year. They are talented. Michael Lorenzen on the hill tonight for the Rangers. Freddie going for the Brewers. Can he build off of a start that was encouraging his last time out? Six innings of shutout ball against the Angels with eight strikeouts. We'd like to see him build on that in this start and start to put together a nice remaining month of June and get himself going again toward the All-Star break and toward the trade deadline. Well, that is tonight. Thank God we've got some normal start times, everybody. 7-10 first pitch tonight, first of three against Texas, and then we get a day off Thursday, and then already it is the final stop at AmFam Field for Craig Council and the Cubs Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. But it is a five-game lead now in the NL Central with the Cardinals getting hot. They are up seven games on the Pirates and eight games on the Cubs entering play today. Is that everything for the Brewers? Manny Parra? Never thought we'd be talking about Manny Parra on this podcast. Let's go over the Bucks and then just hit on a couple of Badger football notes, too. More recruits for that 2025 class. The Bucks had a couple of tidbits come out since our last podcast. It sounds like Malik Beasley is going to be seeking a multi-year offer elsewhere, and he will not be back. He signed the one-year deal. I don't even know how much it was for, three or four million. And he was the starting two guard on this Bucks team. He was fine in the regular season. For a while there, he was one of the top three-point shooters in the NBA. He was shooting around 45 46% from beyond the arc. But as the year went on, and as we got deeper and deeper into it, those percentages started to come down. And then end of the year and in the playoffs, when you really needed bees, when we needed him to be a guy who could score 20-ish a game, who could knock down spot-up threes, in the absence of Giannis, in the absence of Dame Lillard and Chris Middleton being hobbled, they needed Beasley to step up. He couldn't get it done on the offensive end, and we knew he was a bad defender. That was the M.O. on him before he even got to Milwaukee. He's a guy who's going to knock down threes if he's open, but he's not going to be a very good defender. He's not locked in, not a high IQ player, I would say. Didn't seem to really understand the scheme defensively. Got burned quite a bit. He had some moments. There was the moment, I think it was against Indiana in Game 5, where they forced the Game 6. He was pretty good in that game. But it just seemed like this was going to be a one-off for Beasley no matter what. I don't think it's a major loss. It sounds like he's going to go elsewhere. The other big report over the weekend is the potential for, I think it was a Yahoo Sports article, that the Bucks could be looking to ship out Brooke Lopez. And the idea in the article is that they are shopping him around and that Doc Rivers is looking for more versatility on the defensive side of the floor. Look, we talked kind of about this at the end of last year. And we certainly talked about it the year prior. Brooke is at that age. He's 36 years old. He isn't as quick, and he never was a quick player, but he isn't as quick laterally anymore, and the recovery time isn't as good as when he's closing out on guys shooting threes or closing out in the lane. It's to be expected. He's not a young man anymore. It's this coming from a 40-year-old. And as he is aging, the threes aren't going down as much either. He does spread the floor for you, and we all have good memories of Brooke in the 2021 run. And even before that, he was such a key part of the 2019 team where they signed him to a one-year, $3 million deal. It looked like his career was over. And then he reinvented himself with Budenholzer and became a defensive stalwart in the middle of that defense and became a very good three-point shooter and reinvigorated his career in Milwaukee in 2019. Then they signed him to one big extension. They signed him to another extension last year. Even last year, remember the Houston Rockets were entertaining the idea of signing Brooke Lopez because he was a free agent. Him and Middleton were both free agents at the end of last year after that series loss to Miami. And we had that conversation then of should they move on from Brooke? Could you find somebody younger and more athletic to pair next to Giannis in the middle part of that defense? Ultimately, they re-signed both. They signed Middleton to a three-year deal, remember, right? And Brooke to a two-year deal. Was it two years, $48 million? So he is entering the final year of his deal. He could be attractive maybe to that Rockets team again. He could be an attractive piece as a guy who could still give you 25 to 30 quality minutes a night. He's still a guy who's going to block shots. He's going to shoot 32, 33, 34% from beyond the arc. He's won a ring. He's won at the highest level. And he's going into the final year of his deal. Those expiring deals are attractive for a variety of reasons to many different teams. So there could be a market for Brooke. I I don't know if this is actually going to happen. I know they want to make that move, and maybe it's something they do before the draft on Wednesday and you package one of these picks with Brooke and move on from him. I don't know how realistic that is. I don't mind it if they do it. You know, we've been over this, where we all love Brooke and Bobby and Connaughton for the roles they played on a championship team. We'll never forget them. They will never buy a beer in Milwaukee for the rest of their lives. 
I think Brooks going to get his number 11 retired at some point. Giannis, we know that 34 will get retired. Middleton's 22 will get retired. Those are stone cold mortal locks. I think Drew's 21 will at some point. And I think Brooks 11 will too. He will forever be a favorite in Milwaukee. We learned at the end of the season this year and in that Pacers series, especially in that Pacers series, where you saw a team loaded with guys in their early to mid-20s, athletes, they had the stamina, they were getting up and down the floor, and an older Bucks team was going to have a hard time keeping up with them, and they did. There was no greater representation of a team needing to get younger than seeing them against that Pacers team in the playoffs, even though I still think if Giannis is healthy and Dame is healthy, they win that series. But there was a, a, just a dramatic difference in the speed those two teams were playing at. And you could just tell an aging Bucks team didn't really have the legs that the Pacers did. You thought to yourself at the end of that series, we've got to find a way to get younger. Well, this would be one way to do it. If you trade Brooke and you get a younger forward, whoever that would be, I have no idea. A 6'10", 6'11", Miles Turner from the Pacers would be a perfect example, I think, of somebody that they could use. He'll block shots, not the best defensively, but he'll block shots. He knocks down threes with more regularity than Brooke can stretch the floor to. That would be kind of a fit, a player like that. They're not going to get Miles Turner, but a player maybe like that to replace Brooke in the starting five. That was news over the weekend, though. I do have to say, was it not a week or two ago before we got set, before Giannis joined Team Greece and is getting set for these Olympic qualifiers? Brooke and Giannis were vacationing together at Disney. Brooke and his brother Robin are known lovers of Disney. They live in that area. They go to Disney all the time. Well, Mariah and Giannis and their three kids now, they all went and hung out with Brooke. And there was all these pictures of the two of them on these rides, these two giant humans on these small rides, on the teacup rides. And I thought when I saw all of those pictures, well, there's no way they're going to trade Brooke because Giannis won't let it happen. Giannis is loyalty, man. It's a double-edged sword. We love him because that loyalty keeps him in Milwaukee. But a double-edged part of that sword is he keeps these guys around because he's loyal to them and they want a title together, but maybe it is time to move on. I saw those pictures of those two at Disney, though, and thought, oh, boy. There's no chance they're moving on from Brooke if these two are vacationing like the Gatsby's, like they're having a great time at Disney together. That was a Yahoo Sports report, though, over the weekend. I wouldn't think it's crazy. They're shopping, I'm sure. They're just going to see the market. Everything's for sale in this world. They're going to see the market. See if anybody's interested. See what kind of a piece they could get back. But I would think if they are going to do something with a player like Brooke, with a player like Bobby, maybe not so much Pat, but I think they're shopping Pat Connaughton as well. I would think if that's going to happen, it's going to happen this week. The draft is Wednesday and Thursday. The Bucks actually have two picks. It is a weak draft by any measure. Any article that's come out about this draft has said the talent pool is not deep in this draft. Even the number one overall pick. Or the number two or number three. You know, most years you feel like you're going to get a pretty good piece there. That's not even the case with this draft. So keep that in mind, too. The Bucks actually have picks, but it is not a deep draft. They have the 23rd pick in the first round, 33rd pick in the second round. If they're going to move on from one of these guys, though, maybe they package up the number 23 and Brooke Lopez and send them somewhere and get somebody younger and more athletic in return. Or maybe you package up Brooke and the 33rd pick or whatever. My thinking, though, is that if they make a move like that, it probably happens this week. Now, if they just stand pat and they have these picks and they use them and they use them for their own team on Wednesday and Thursday, it is so important for John Horst to get something here. One of the problems this Bucks team has is that they have not drafted well. And I know it's hard to say that when they drafted Giannis. Giannis gets you the get-out-of-jail-free card for about, what, 10 to 15 years of bad drafting when you draft a -a once-in-a-lifetime international talent the way they did with Giannis where nobody knew who he was. They took him in the first round, this 18-year-old kid playing in the Greek B League, and then you hit the home run they hit with him where he becomes one of the all-time great players. That buys you a lot of draft capital when you look at the draft history. But when you look through the last 10 to 15 years of Milwaukee Bucks drafting, It's not very good, and that's how we're getting to where we are now, where they have to make moves. They have to make trades to get guys. They have to sign free agents to bigger deals because they're not getting a lot of production from young talent that is under contract, those rookie contracts that are not worth as much as the free agent contracts other guys are signing. It has been years of bad drafting that has led them down this road where they are older and slower than everybody, where they're having to spend money in free agency and make trades because they just haven't found a lot of usable talent in the draft. You go back and look. I've got it up right now. Let's go back to 2010. So that is 14 years, the last 14 years. Larry Sanders, they took in the first round in 2010. 
I know the end of his career was bizarre and the marijuana and all that kind of stuff. He was a serviceable NBA player for a while. Then the next year, they took and traded Jimmer Fredette, so they got nothing there. The next year, they took John Henson, and he was okay for three or four years. He's out of the league now. Then they took Giannis in 2013, obviously a home run, grand slam, whatever. And then the next year, they took Jabari, which was the pick we all expected them to take, second overall. Injuries derailed the Jabari career. He's not in the league anymore. Damian Inglis was taken in the second round that year. He's not in the league anymore. The next year, they took Rashad Vaughn. He's not in the league anymore. The next year, they took Thon Maker. He had a couple of years where he was okay. He's not in the league anymore. Second round in 2016, they get Malcolm Brogdon. He is a good-ish player still, even though he's getting a bit older now, and injuries have been a problem for him. He was the rookie of the year that year. So that's one. The next year in 2017, DJ Wilson, not in the league. They draft Cinderius Thornwell, not in the league. The next year was the DiVincenzo draft. He was okay for Milwaukee. He has developed into a good player, but elsewhere. The next year, they take Kevin Porter and trade him. The next year, they take RJ Hampton and Jordan Wara. Wara will be out of the league, I would think, in the next year or so, and Hampton is in Denver, maybe. The next year, they had one pick. They take Isaiah Todd, not in the league. The next year, they take Marjan Bochamp. Showed you a little bit in the first half of that rookie year. Has fallen off since then, and we don't know what he is now. And then last year, they got Chris Livingston with the second-to-last pick of the draft, and he saw a little bit of time at the end of blowouts last year. So on that list, from 2010 through now, of course you got Giannis, which, as I said, I think buys you a lot of capital when we look back at these drafts. But other than that, you got DiVincenzo in 2018, who is turning into a decent player on another franchise, and you got Brogdon, and that's it. I mean, that's like 26 players in the course of, or 25 players in the course of 14 or 15 years of drafting, and they haven't gotten much. And that leads you to a point where you're spending a lot of money to make up for that in free agency. You're having to make trades to make up for that for older, more veteran players. And then you end up in a situation where they end up last year where they are not a very deep team and they are an older team as well. So if they do stay at these picks on Wednesday and Thursday, it is crucial that they find something they can use. Now, last year... You get Andre Jackson Jr. in the trade as well. He looks like he could be something, at least defensively. He's got a long way to go offensively. They got A.J. Green as an undrafted free agent. They didn't draft him. He looks like he's going to be a decent piece as a spot-up shooter. But they just haven't had an impact player where when you look over the course of Denver's draft history or who just won the title, (laughs) Boston's draft history, they're finding guys that are usable pieces, even if they're just bench players, role players, they're having impacts in big moments in the playoffs. And the Bucs have not really had that from any of the picks they've taken over the course of the last 14 or 15 years. If they don't package these picks and trade them or trade up or trade for a, a player or package them with a current player and then get something in return, it is critical that John Horst finds something with this 23rd and 33rd overall pick on Wednesday and Thursday, something he can use going forward as a, as a usable piece on this team. And then finally today, let's just get to an edge rusher that committed to Wisconsin over the weekend, Nicholas Clayton, three-star edge rusher. He had offers on the table from Florida State. He had offers on the table from USC and Michigan State and Nebraska, and he comes to Luke Fickle with that ad now. The 2025 class is ranked number four in the country. And then, like we said the last time we talked about this, there's a long way between now and 2025, and a lot of those blue chip players are going to wait at least a few months here before they make their call for 2025. But I think we're starting to see the tide turn a bit here for as disappointing as year one one was under Fickle, and some of the transfers didn't work out, and the cupboard was far more bare than we thought it was once the Christ and Leonard regime left. I think we're starting to see now him slowly turn this boat around. It's not easy to turn a boat around, but he's slowly starting to turn this thing around. We hope to see improvements on the field this year where they're not 7-5 and five or 6-6 six and six or whatever they were again, and they win eight or nine games. And then I think really that 2025 class, 2026, 2027, you're going to see this team start to win 10-plus games again and be in the running for now with the expanded playoffs be in the running for a playoff spot in that window, but the fourth best recruiting class right now for 2025. That'll do it for us here on your Monday morning. We'll get back after it on Friday. We'll talk about the week that was for the Brewers. We'll set up the second matchup with Craig Council at AmFam Field. We'll talk about the NBA draft, whatever the Bucks do, if they make a big trade or if they just stand pat or they make a minor trade. 
We'll be recapping that on Friday as well. Have a great work week. We'll chat with you then.